Right, so I have uh, four sons, and they all love Pokemon. Uh, to protect their privacy, I'll not use their real names. I'll call them Kid 1, Kid 2, Kid 3, and Kid 4. Now, periodically, I buy these kids Pokemon trading cards. And for the purposes of this video, let's assume that there's only four kinds of Pokemon trading cards. Uh, now, they have different you know, quality levels. This one card is the best card. Two is the second best card, etc. This four is the worst card. So that's the ranking we have on these uh, different Pokemon cards. So the way it works is they're there in my house, and uh, you know I buy them some card. I open up the pack. It's a let's say a four. Now the biggest kid is kid one, and so he just snatches that card four and keeps it for himself. Maybe later I'll buy another card, and perhaps it's also a four. You know, it's the most common card being the worst card, and put it up for grabs. And of course, kid one, the biggest kid, also just uh, clutches that one. Now, maybe the next week I buy another card, and this time it's a three, and so, you know, kid one grabs that as well. Now, before it gets too unfair, I should say that uh, there's a household harmony re rule we have, which is that whenever you get a, you know, new Pokemon card, you have to put up for grabs, you have to donate your next best card, you know, should one exist. So the previous two times, actually, when kid one grabbed a four, he didn't have any card that was worse than a four, so he didn't have to put anything up for grabs. But now that he's getting a three... You know, it's uh, only fair that he has to take, you know, his next worst card, which is a four, and, you know, donate it to the household. And then, of course, Kid 2, being the second biggest of the sons, will just grab that. And actually, there's no card worse than a four, so Kid 2 doesn't have to give up anything. Let's say a two comes along the next time I get a card. So, once again, Kid 1 will grab that. And then, by the household harmony rule, he has to give up his next best card, which is a three. Now, Kid 2, being the next biggest kid, will grab that. But by the Household Harmony rule, he has to give up his next best card, which is a 4. And finally now, Kid 3 is able to snatch that, and there is no card worse than a 4, so Kid 3 just gets to keep it. Poor Kid 4, God love him. He doesn't know the difference between, like, a Porygon and a Pikachu. He's just happy to get any card, so... Well, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> uh, let's say another 4 comes in. Kid 1 grabs it. He doesn't have a worse card, so he just gets to keep it. 3 comes in. Kid 1 grabs it. Has to give up a 4. And Kid 2 will grab this. Doesn't have a worse card than a 4, so he'll just keep it. Another 4 comes in. Kid 1 just grabs it. Another 1. Now, yeah, let's say a 1 comes in. And uh, now finally Kid 4 is going to get something in his life. So Kid 1 will grab the 1. He has to give us next best card, which is the 2. And then Kid 2 grabs that. He has to give up his next best card, which is a 3. Then Kid 3 will grab that. And he's obliged to give up his next best card, which is the 4. And finally, Kid 4 will get something. He'll grab that 4. You'll notice that Kid 4 will only ever get 4 cards. He'll never get anything better than that. And he'll only get a 4 once, you know, the cards that have handed, been handed out contain a, a 4, and then a 3, and then a 2, and then a 1. Which did happen at this point. Uh, maybe the next card also by a miracle is a 1. So Kid 1 will grab that. His next best card is actually a 3. He happens to not have a 2. So he puts the 3 up for grabs. Kid 2 takes the 3. Has to give up the four. Kid three grabs the four. He doesn't have a worse card, etc. Okay, you might be wondering why I'm talking about Pokemon for so long. Uh, well, actually, this process that I've been describing, wherein new, you know, symbols that have ranks come in periodically and they're arranged like this, it's actually called the RSK algorithm. Uh, RSK stands for Robinson, Shenstead, and Knuth. It's a combinatorial algorithm that arose, um, well, because of representation theory. So uh, <clears throat> we're actually performing this uh, RSK algorithm. You can imagine performing it not just on some arbitrary sequence of cards, but, you know, when you buy Pokemon cards, the ones you get are kind of chosen randomly. And so we might imagine this uh, RSK algorithm with a probabilistic input where the sequence of cards is drawn at random and the probability of getting a card of rank J is some probability PJ. And in my example, D, the number of possible ranks, was 4. And you should imagine that I buy a total of n cards. Now, after I buy all the cards, you know, I want to check in on my kids. I certainly don't know the difference between a Oshawott and a whatever. So I just tell them to flip over their decks because I just want to count how many cards each one has. So they flip over their decks. And, you know, once the decks are flipped over and we only look at how many cards each kid had, you may notice that this kind of looks like a sorted histogram or Young diagram. 
And so we can think of the final sort of output of this RSK process with our probabilistic distribution on cards and our purchase of n cards as producing, well, a, a young diagram with n boxes and a number of rows, that's at most the number of um, ranks, which is also the number of kids. And miracle of miracles, in this process, the resulting random young diagram lambda is exactly distributed according to this sure while distribution that I described in the last video, which if you recall is the distribution you get from doing this sort of symmetry type measurement on n copies of an identical, uh, of an identical quantum state. So to remind you of that, we imagine we had this uh, quantum state with uh, d probabilities, p1 through pd. The actual um, vectors associated with this quantum state didn't matter for what we were doing. Uh, if we have n copies of it, we can put it into this uh, Schurweil measurer, which if we can build a full-fledged quantum computer would be an efficient process. And it takes those dice and kind of outputs a Young diagram that represents the, a symmetry type of the associated random tensor that it picks internally. Uh, and I said, you know, the shape of the Young diagram that you see, lambda, has this funny distribution called the Schurweil distribution, which can be defined, you know, with this formula from representation theory with the Schur polynomial applied to the p's times this dimension of the lambda irrep. But as I said, um, you know, there's a completely different way to understand this exact same probability distribution on uh, Young diagrams lambda, and it's exactly the you know the output of this uh, Pokemon process with card probabilities p1 through pd and n cards. And this sort of Pokemon dynamics, or RSK dynamics, if you want to be a little bit more formal, um, the existence of this kind of combinatorial algorithmic interpretation of this probability distribution uh, proved very important for like having the ability to you know, make good inferences about the properties of lambda drawn from this distribution. Let me give you a little bit of an illustration of what it's good for. Um, and this is called Green's theorem. So uh, Green's theorem is a theorem in combinatorics related to this Pokemon or RSK process. It's not about a probabilistic input, it's about any arbitrary input. So let's imagine we have some input C, which is a sequence of card ranks, C1 through Cn, that come in over time. Imagining now we in general have D possible ranks. Um, and let's, you know, do this Pokemon process where we dole them out and the kids sort of trade them out according to the household harmony rule. And at the end, lambda is the sort of shape of the, the Young diagram at the end. Uh, so here's an example with, uh, I don't know how many, 14 uh, cards, I think, with ranks one through four. And if you run through the process with the kids, the RSK process, the eventual output will look like this. So at the end, the kid number one will have seven cards, kid number two will have three cards, kid number th three will have three cards, and kid number four managed to get one card at the end of it. So we say lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four are these four numbers, seven, three, three, one. Okay, so Green's theorem says that these numbers have a very natural interpretation in terms of the sequence of cards that was handed out. So let's think about the first one here. So Green's theorem says that lambda one is the following. It's the length of the longest increasing subsequence in the card ranks C. Here, by increasing, I mean non-decreasing. So if we take a look at that, if we take a look at these pink uh, ranks, one, one, two, three, three, four, four. That's the longest increasing subsequence you can find in this. And uh, that's the reason why the number of cards of the first kit or the number of the boxes in the first row is seven. Now it's not the case that like the actual ranks of the cards that kid one holds on to are these numbers, one, one, two, three, three, four, uh, four. But uh, if he gets seven cards, it's because there's a longest increasing subsequence of length seven. And this is not too hard to see. If you play around with this process, you'll find that if you just keep track of kid one's card count, it's really kind of carrying out the natural dynamic programming algorithm for computing the longest increasing uh, subsequence in a string. <clears throat> now the subsequent numbers, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four, et cetera, have uh, an interpretation too. Uh, you might hope that maybe lambda 2 is something like the length of the second longest increasing subsequence in the string. That's not quite right, but lambda 2 is that number such that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is the length of the longest union of two um, disjoint increasing subsequences. So if we take a look at this example C again, uh, you see here that um, we have this pink sequence of length 7 and this green sequence of length 3. They're both increasing. And uh, 7 plus 3 is 10, and that's why lambda 2 is 3. 
And again, lambda 3 is such that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is the length of the longest union of three increasing subsequences. Now, you can't necessarily do it greedily. In fact, um, if you peer at this, here we have three increasing subsequences, one of length 6, one of length uh, 4, and one of length 3. Um, this is the longest way you can put together three increasing subsequences, and the total length is 13, which is why, given that the first two rows are 7 and 3, the third one is 3 as well. Um, and finally, the, the fourth one is, is 1, because, well, you can always make up, uh, if there are four ranks, four increasing subsequences consisting of, like, all the 1s, that's increasing, all the 2s, that's increasing, all the 3s, that's increasing, all the 4s, that's increasing. Okay, so... Um, this is like another nice combinatorial interpretation of this Pokemon process that, again, can help you reason about the kind of uh, random lambdas you get out of it. Okay, so now let's continue thinking about uh, the case of a random input. And, uh, you know, just to give you some examples, I actually, you know, had my computer cook up some actual simulations. So I imagine there's four ranks again, with uh, P1 through P4 being 5%, 15%, 30%, and 50%. And I, you know, simulated 100 cards, and I, I did this three times, and these are the three, you know, young diagrams I got. And I cooked it up so that the width of this screen that you're staring at is exactly the width of 100 cards. So if, like, some miracle occurred and Kid 1 got all the cards, then it would go all the way across. Uh, so this is about halfway. Let me put that up. So here's the 50% of the way across the screen, or exactly 50 cards, 30 cards, 15 cards, 5 cards. And, uh... One thing you might observe is it's reasonably close to being the case that the longest row is around 50% of the cards, the second longest row is reasonably around 30% of the cards, the third longest is reasonably around 15% of the cards, the fourth longest is reasonably around 5% of the cards. So we'll see in a moment if that's a coincidence or not. Uh, now let me zoom in and show you one more example. I'm going to show you what the results of one more simulation with 100 cards, um, but with different probabilities. Or in fact, not different probabilities, but just permuted probabilities. So consider this case where the, the probabilities are just reversed. So some kind of like communist world where like the best card is also the most common card. That's unlikely. 50%. The second best card is, you know, 30% and so forth. So same probabilities, but just reordered. So the best card is now the most frequent card. And here's what uh, one typical outcome of that Pokemon process is. And uh, it's quite interesting. So on one hand, if you actually stare at the card ranks that each kid got, it looks very different. Like, you know, in the first three examples, you know, the kid one had like a mix of ones and twos and threes and fours. In this last example with the reverse probabilities, Kid 1 pretty much has all 1s, except for a few at the end. Similarly, Kid 2 has pretty much all 2s, except for a few at the end, and 3s and 4s. But actually, the numbers of cards that the kids have still looks kind of like the first kid gets about 50% of the cards, the second kid gets about 30% of the cards, and, and so forth. And that's funny because, of course, the, you know, the way the Pokemon process works, it certainly depends a lot on what the, the ranks are, because you know, the kids like to keep their best cards. But here's a fun kind of exercise or puzzle for you. You can actually show with a combinatorial proof that the uh, Pokemon process is invariant to permuting the card probabilities. In, uh, in particular, vis-a-vis -vis how many cards the kids have at the end. You see like the actual ranks of the cards they have at the end changes. But if you only you know, do like I, the dad, does and count the number of cards they have at the end, then the distribution on the, you know, the card counts you see is actually invariant to permuting the probabilities. It's kind of funny, but it's true. Okay, interesting. So uh, getting back to our question, let's assume the card ranks, P1 through PD, are sorted in descending order, which is, as we now know, kind of without loss of generality. And let lambda be drawn from this sure while process uh, involving p. And remember, we can think of this as two ways. We can either think of it as the result of this Pokemon process with n cards, with these probabilities for the cards, or we can think of it as you know we took you know uh, quantum die with d probabilities p1 through p d associated to it. We took n copies of that die and we put it into this sure while measurement device, and it gave us back a young diagram based on some uh, representation theory. So as we saw, you know, by my simulations, it kind of vaguely looked that for large n, um, the number of boxes in the jth row was roughly around the jth largest p value times n. Like the number of boxes in the first row was kind of like the largest probability, which is 0.5 in our example, times n, and so forth. To make this a bit more precise, 
Let me uh, say that given uh, an outcome lambda, we divide all the, the row lengths, lambda j, by n and call that p hat j. And I'll put parentheses n to show the dependence on n. And you know, if this approximation was true, then you might do this because uh, p hat j might be kind of like a guess or an estimate for p j, the jth largest probability. And uh, if we're wondering whether or not this is a good guess or estimate, then we kind of want to know, is it true that um, you know, for fixed p's, if you take the limit as n goes to infinity and draw lambda at random, according to this uh, Pokemon process, does p hat n as a vector tend to p? Well, uh, this was studied about 40 years ago by Anatoly Vershik and Sergei Karov, and they showed the answer is yes in 1981. And that's great, this theorem, because it suggests uh, an algorithm for learning the probabilities, or eigenvalues as they really are, of a quantum state rho. So uh, remember in the last video we talked about how, you know, given copies of a quantum state rho, you might try to try to learn the eigenvalues or the p's and also the eigenvectors, the u's, but let me just focus on the p's for now. And we kind of argued that you may as well just get back this uh, sure while measurement, lambda, but how do you go from that to an, a guess or an estimate for the p's? And this suggests you should just, you know, normalize the box lengths or the row lengths by n, call that p hat and use that as your estimate. So, um, you know, we need to dive a little bit more into the, the error you know, uh, bars for this algorithm. But this limiting result says that it's a, a good idea in general. Um, what's quite interesting to me is the following. Uh, what was Vershik and Karov's uh, motivation for studying this? Obviously, they didn't care about, well, uh, that's not obvious, but they didn't care about quantum computing, nor did they care about Pokemon. Um, their motivation was uh, the representation theory of the symmetric group on infinitely many letters, which is kind of naturally... Um, related to these, these questions with probability distributions on the RSK algorithm. Um, what's cool though is that this idea of making this Shervile measurement and trying to use it as um, an estimator for the eigenvalues of an unknown quantum state um, is kind of going a little bit from um, theory to maybe practice. So here's a paper from Physical Review Letters in 2018, a snippet from it. It's called spectrum estimation or eigenvalue estimation, in other words, of density operators. These are these quantum states rho using alkaline earth atoms. And you can see they talk about, you know, potentially doing physical experiments that use this, you can see right here, empirical Young diagram algorithm, which is exactly what we've been talking about, to try to learn the eigenvalues of an unknown uh, mixed quantum state. And there's a little picture here with like n equals six, you know, showing a bunch of different uh, six box Young diagrams. And it's just really cool to me that, you know, this uh, Vershik Karov result, which, you know, if you're trying to explain in 1981 to the person sitting next to you on a plane, like, oh, I'm studying this result in, in the representation theory of the symmetric group on infinitely many letters, it might sound like very abstruse, but now we can see that it's actually directly related to, as is stated in the abstract here, you know, potential practical performance of a, a procedure for... Um, estimating quantum states and applications to quantum computing.